Welcome to Neuro Noodles Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. And a special thanks to our gold and silver supporters. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now. Dr. Brian Rosino, Washington, D.C., Bite Size Therapy. What's up? Let me get my video started. There we go. TikTok guy. 600-something thousand people. Holy cow. Welcome to the show, Dr. Brian Rosino, again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Nice Thanks to so meet much. you. Dr. Yeah. Gunkelman, nice to meet you. Just tech. Just a tech. Just a tech. Okay. Uh, an old Jay, one. Jay, how many brain scans have you read in your lifetime? I quit counting in the early 90s at 500,000. Seriously? Yeah. That's insane, man. Well, we did over 100 a day in the lab. What lab did you work at? In San Francisco, Dr. Harley Shear. Yeah. It was a telephonic EEG lab. We had 400 hospitals across the U.S. that broadcast into us off satellite. Really? And uh, we'd print them out and uh, process them and have them interpreted and get reports typed up and sent back. It, it's you so far back. Cranking them we, out. Well, we actually used devices before faxes called QIP, uh, which was a rotary uh, analog uh, transmission device. Wow. Uh, it put the document that you typed into it uh, face up, basically. It would be on a rotary drum, and it had a little reader head that would print at the other end little dots of black when, when whatever image came past, and it would reproduce the document at the other end. Not really, you know, it's kind of a dot matrix, uh, you know, sort of a recreation, but you could get the report back. So Got the job done. We updated to uh, fax and... Uh, eventually, you know, email. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, when you're doing a minimum of a hundred a day, the numbers get real big, real fast. So, oh, sure, yeah. There, there were days we topped two hundred, and <clears throat> we all had the, the the nightmare that there would be a day where all four hundred hospitals would send something in. You know, so yeah. Was it stressful? <laughs> the a uh, uh, hundred a day I could do real easily. Um, uh, two hundred a day was work. Uh, the 400 day was literally a nightmare. So yeah. Um, yeah. we 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 didn't hit it, but we all feared it, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and you had multiple doctors reading, so I had exposures to some really quite extraordinary uh, uh, docs who uh, taught me uh, EEG. A fortunate circumstance to sit at the bottom of a funnel, that kind of volume coming through. Uh, uh, UC San Francisco, the residents there in neurology would come through the lab to, the, to get exposure to larger volumes of, of data. Right. So they, would, they would stand and look over your shoulder as you're flipping paper and tell you to slow down. <laughs> and uh, I would tell them, no, you have to speed up. I can't slow down. We have a pile building. Next <laughs> to you. If yeah. a handful of paper tips over, you can, it's hard to put it back together. So, oh, man, um, yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway, back in the old days, they still had to kill trees to do EGs, and it was printed on on paper. We had truckloads of uh, uh, plexiglass uh, paper coming in every every week. We had a, a, a bobtail truck that would drop off case after case after case of paper, and uh, and we would ship it out. You know, the the riggers didn't belong to us; they belonged to the hospital. So uh, you'd acquire them in a in a uh, in the stacks. And then distribute them, uh, 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 you know, periodically when they built up for a given hospital, you box them up and ship them back. Doctor Rosino, could we get a little background on you? I mean, you know, no. we'll we'll introduce people to your last show, and I think you only had like twenty something thousand people following you on TikTok. Now you're at over six hundred thousand. Who are you? What's changed? What do you do? Yeah, yeah, I'm a. Uh... I'm a mystery and an enigma. No, I'm, uh, so I'm a PhD, doctor of psychology. Did, uh, did my training primarily with children and adolescents. And um, my pri- I have a private practice now here in uh, Northern Virginia that I've been uh, operating for um, 18 years. But I've been, pra- I've, you know, I've been practicing and, and uh, <clears throat> depending on how you look at it, I've been seeing children and families for over 25 years. You know, I have a background in neuropsychology. I'm not a neuropsychologist, but you know, you know, background in it, meaning that I did rotations, rotation in neurology as a as an extern, and then neuropsychology as a intern. I do a lot of testing, and I do a fair amount of testing, it, much more now. I think in the last six months or last year, you know, around issues of learning disabilities, developmental disorders. Occasionally, I'll see kids that have you know um, issues like seizures. Or, you know, I don't see too many kids that have had neurological conditions that have required surgery or anything like that. So like, you know, they've had, you know, sometimes, you know, neuropsychologists will do a lot of the work around rehabilitation and assessment for, you know, function and stuff like that. But mine is primarily just diagnosing learning disabilities, diagnosing developmental uh, disorders, ADHD, that sort of thing. And I do a lot of therapy with, with both children and families. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Well, one of the questions that I was going to ask you is that, like, some of the technology around EEGs has changed. If you're not using paper anymore, or you know, the the the, the way that you monitor brain activity, uh, you know, with, with the electrodes or the the, the skull caps or whatever, uh, maybe that's gotten better in some ways. Uh, has the has the found fundamental aspect of the EEG, the waves, wave detection, has that changed? Is that or is that kind of the same? Well, it depends upon whether you're dealing with classical clinical EEG, which is still fairly traditional. Uh, that you know, it's limited to diagnosing epilepsy and encephalopathies, uh, which is very limiting. Uh, but now they're they're trying to expand out into uh, the ability to use the EEG in psychiatry and psychology to identify you know ADD subgroups. Um, uh, you know, the, the evaluating the neuropsychological function based on the EEG. Right. And um, the, the incidence of epileptiform content that uh, in, in people that don't have epilepsy, you know, yeah. there's never a seizure, but there's a discharge. And yeah. for those people, we actually have an 85% improvement clinically if they actually are treated with an anticonvulsant, even though they have no seizures. And yeah. neuro- neurology traditionally would not treat you unless you have a seizure. If right. you have an epileptiform discharge, uh, they basically say, we don't treat the EEG, we treat the patient. And I always say, well, who do you think made the EEG? You know, so, you know, uh, this, uh, I didn't draw this out on, with an ink pen, you know? So um, it, it, if you've got an epileptiform discharge in the brain, it's something that has to be stabilized and dealt with. And uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, the, it, it's all too easy to dismiss it as just a, an electrical anomaly uh, that, that has no clinical meaning. But it does, you know. Um, sure. Uh, we had the occurrence at one point. Dr. Kropotov, who was the head of the Soviet Union's uh, neuroscience program and then head of Russian neuroscience once it broke down from the Union, uh, and I, he and I lectured together in Australia, and he was demonstrating event-related potentials. A neurologist who took the ERP test as a demo um, uh, after the recording, we were looking at the EG. I see a discharge left frontally. And he said, well, it's meaningless. You know, I'm surprised anybody saw it and it's meaningless. 
And it's an interesting thought, you know, uh, that there's a discharge in your brain that's meaningless. If, yeah. As a neurologist, how, how do you come up with an opinion like that as a neurologist? The EG is meaningless? Come on. So yeah. uh, um, he had a performance. You had to hit a button when, when you see the right sim symbol to tell you to hit the button. You have to avoid hitting the button when you're not supposed to. You're looking yeah. at reaction time, variability, like any CPT task, only yeah. they're recording the EG. He only had two omission errors, no commission errors, really good reaction time, low variability. The two times he missed were the two times the discharges happened. Oh, look at that. Okay. Now, tell me again, this is a meaningless discharge. You know, right. so you know, the, he, he didn't notice it. Uh, it. It was a snippet out of his uh, stream of consciousness that he didn't notice. Sure. Yeah. But it's not meaningless. And. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it takes time uh, to get neurology and psychiatry to actually look at the EG as a, as a tool other than just the traditional neurological epilepsy encephalopathy as a neuropsychological reflection of, of brain function. Uh, but that's ultimately uh, the, the, the proper perspective. And the, it's, it's taking time, but you know the research domain criteria, uh, uh, getting rid of the DSM and actually looking at uh, you know, biological signals as, a, as biomarkers and phenotypes it ends up being, I think, the proper way to go. Well, instead of giving a waste or a whisk, you can give them an EEG, right? Well, they're, uh, they have a great uh, corroboration, one of the other. Uh, if you end up having uh, a good correlation between the results, you end up having a higher level of confidence in the, in the, the prediction uh, from, from the data. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so doing paper and pencil and EEG uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. go together very well. You know, the EEG may disturb a brief moment, but the rest of the stream of consciousness may be okay. In which case, you're going to perform pretty well. I mean, the guy was a neurologist. I mean, he he wasn't a failure in life. I mean, he's you know making really good income, a high level job, good responsibility. Uh, you know, by all measures he's a high high level success how did you uh, respond to that how did you respond when you pointed out you know well uh, uh, uh one one of the reasons that they were at that meeting was to do qeg eeg with me and erp with yuri and we talked about neurofeedback as a treatment for people that have discharges you know you don't have to have a seizure to end up having neurofeedback to end up helping to stabilize the discharge so um, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty easy if you see a discharge to be able to target it, the stabilizing protocol uh, so that the person learns to control the discharge. Mm. I mean, your brain isn't uh, run by a bunch of strings going up to some master puppeteer. You know, you may not know what you're doing, but you're doing it. So uh, learning how to operate the brain, you know, we don't come with a driver's training course in a, in a, in a manual, you know, so... Uh, it, it takes learning to, uh, to learn how to control brain function. Hmm. And luckily, uh, you know, learning works. You know, it, uh, uh, a lot of people don't believe in neurofeedback as a bunch of computers from the 70s. And I have to apologize for that reputation, by the way. You know, I, I was one of those hippies in the 70s. So, um, you know, the field did have that. But there were also military people from DARPA, um, you know, academics like Sturman and um, you know, Neil Miller from Yale. I mean, there was a whole bunch of really luminary field uh, mm -hmm. individuals, mm -hmm. but, but there were also people interested in consciousness. So it, it wasn't all medical model. Uh, there were people into meditation and consciousness who were looking at the EG at that point too. So, and you know, it was a- I remember, I remember being in a, I think it was a neuropsych class uh, where <laughs> professor liked me. So he picked on me. And he gave me a stack of quarters and he set them up basically as a, as a, a tower test, right? Dallas Capital and tower test. And he said, you know, he told me, this is what you need to do. And I'm like the whole class is standing around me, right? I'm like, you know, I'm never gonna be able to do this. Um, and so what I had to do is I had to like stack the stack and restack and had to get them in a certain order, right? And it's not, it's not obvious what, how to get there. From, from point A to point D or whatever, right? It's very, what you might call intuitive, right? So you're just sort of going through the process and I figured it out. I have no idea how I figured it out, but I figured it out, 
And that was his example of implicit learning, right? Um, and, the, you know, and, and we see this obviously in, in neurological patients that have, you know, maybe dementia, for example. There, there are things that remain, you know, intact, although they have no conscious sort of idea that they can do these things, they can do them. Um, there's there are examples of memory and that sort of thing. Is that kind of what you're talking about as far as the training goes, this in, implicit learning and how the brain kind of just figures it out at that unconscious level, how to, how to, how to not only monitor it, but then how to regulate? It, in fact, it's an ineffable experience. If I could tell you how we did it internally, we could do talk therapy without the feedback. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, um, it, it, and there's, I don't have anything against talk therapy. I think there's a lot of value to interaction. Uh, however, uh, interacting with your brain with a device in between you and the brain to feed it back so you can see it like a fancy mirror, you know, uh, you, uh, make faces. Well, you're not going to get really good at gurning, making faces with gurning unless you actually have a mirror uh, so you can see what you're doing. Uh, so we've got a fancy mirror. It lets us see how our brain is working. Uh, the person running that device basically has to tune it so it's showing the kind of activity that you're really interested in. But, it, you know, feedback. It, how, how did you learn how to eat? Well, you threw it over one shoulder and you stood it over the top, you plopped it on your forehead, finally you find your mouth. Well, you know, uh, you, you end up learning how to operate that spoon so you can actually put it in your mouth reliably, but it's trial and error. And mm -hmm. the, the same, you, you do stupid things, you know, trying hard to relax, you know, the, 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 everybody makes, you know, foolish attempts at controlling brain activity. But eventually, the ones that don't work are set aside, and uh, learning passive volition isn't easy. I mean, letting go to make something happen. It, that, that's the antithesis of the kind of the American way of buckle down, work hard, you know, hit it hard, you can do it. Well, well letting we go this in, to make something happen. We see this in happen. creativity. Don't we see this in creativity? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Need to back off and let go and allow your brain to do the work, which means sort of in, in removing that conscious piece. Yeah. Now, you have to have already done the work to put the information in yeah. uh, to end up having the creative re derubricizing, bre breaking down the normal uh, names yeah. and barriers and everything and letting it come back together with a different structure. Yeah. And, you know, that quite often happens in, in a hypnagogic state. Uh, people that have the information already in their head reorganize it. Uh, in, a meditative in the, state? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a theta-like brain state uh, that doesn't have the normal adult boundaries on everything. And mm -hmm. you, you basically end up reorganizing uh, material into a, a different structure. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the sewing machine was apparently developed in a dream. Uh, the, the, the fellow moved the hole down to the tip of the needle. Um, uh, uh, he actually saw himself in a pot uh, with uh, the people coming at him with spears with a hole in the end of the spear and kind of woke up with a start and said, oh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know re restructured the sewing machine and, and came up with a way to make that work organic chemistry, dozing off on a streetcar, going home from work. And instead of a linear structure, yeah. you saw fuzzy balls stick together, finally make a chain and play crack the whip. And they came around and made a ring. Boom, the carbon ring. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the, the restructuring of ideas you already have, but don't have them right. And you, you can't do that by thinking hard. You do that by letting go and letting I things hardly think restructure. It. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, the, the foolish attempts at trying hard to relax kind of stuff, the, the, the thinking hard to make your brain work, uh, you know, uh, it, it, everybody tries it, you know, and they'll try various mental tricks, thinking about this, thinking about that. And, uh, but eventually, you know, you, you, you find that the act of thinking gets in the way of actually doing. And, you know, you know, thinking about it isn't doing it. And 
but you know, operant conditioning is one model. Uh, you're you're getting successive approximations, and you're getting better at it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily explain all of the kinds of learning that are observed. You you uh, sometimes see a sudden change in kind, and operant conditioning doesn't really predict a sudden change in kind. Um, systems theory does. Uh, if you provide feedback to a system, it can self-regulate and change state. So uh, system theory combined with operant conditioning, uh, the, the, the overall uh, uh, integrated complex model of how everything works probably doesn't exist yet, but uh, you've got you've to gotta honor both of those approaches because they both describe some of what we see. Um, we saw this with... We saw this with uh, language, right? When we tried to understand how people uh, acquire language and the language acquisition device, and, you know, uh, tried to operantly teach people, you know, how to speak and that sort of thing. But the way that the brain actually worked, it would make these leaps, right? Yeah. Make these huge leaps, and they had no idea how they got from, you know, this point to this point, but the brain was doing yeah. that. And, and in a way that's not, like you said, you used, a, I think, a really important word which is linear or non-linear we like we we like our conscious brain thinks in a very linear sequential way doesn't it but that's not actually how our brain works yeah. uh, when it comes down to it, it seems yeah and, and there are linear models of brain activity and they all fail right. <laughs> so right. uh, and, and they fail more at the extremes than they do in the the routine um uh, if you get an epileptic arm discharge, that's horribly nonlinear, and and uh, and you know simple background algorithm, uh, it's just sputtering away at the back of the head, uh, kind of fits a linear model. But when you get to the extremes of uh, consciousness change, of falling asleep from the awake state to drowsy to, to actually being asleep, those changes aren't linear. Uh, they, they're they're changes in kind. And you know they're they're not easily uh, predictable. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of people with AI trying to predict uh, uh, the the occurrence of epilepsy before the seizure happens, so you get a warning. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you got to stabilize yourself because you're about to have a seizure. Well, so far, all of those have failed. Um, they're getting closer, uh, but. You know, there's a difference between the old skin version of intelligence and AI. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the modeling I've done on EG in the publications about EG based phenotypes, uh, that was all using the old skin version. Exposed to over 500,000 EGs, you start to see patterns in the data. And, you know, when you see patterns in your data, you got two options. You could see meaningful patterns or you could just be freaking crazy. You know, I'm, I'm seeing things, you know, so sure, yeah. um, your and, brain could be putting things yeah, together. Uh, obviously you, you could yeah. project a pattern that you're, you know, you learned about in some science fiction book and now you're looking at the data and you kind of see a pattern you think you see. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do when you see a pattern in the data is actually to publish about it. And if the pattern predicts things, the model predicts things, those predictions can be tested. You know, you got to kick the tires, but you got to publish about it first. So uh, 2005, I published about 11 EG patterns. Two had known genetic correlates, so they were endophenotypic. And the other nine, I suggested we just didn't know their genetic correlates yet, but that they were probably, they were candidate phenotypes. Mm -hmm. And it worked out. I mean, the, the, all of them now have known genetic correlates. And, you know, the, uh, if you have a phenotype, it doesn't matter what your DSM category is. You, you're, this is a genetically linked pattern, and you're going to respond regardless of what DSM category they've thrown you in. You respond to the same therapy. You're, you're the same entity as the other ones in that group. So let me, let me it, ask it, you it cuts across the DSM. And it predicts it accurately predicts therapy as opposed to the DSM, which predicts billing, but it doesn't predict therapy. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't don't get me started. So um, you could go. So let's take it from one. So you could go from you know give everybody an EEG, and then we'll pick out the ones that have these patterns, and now we can kind of figure out if there's anything we need to do with them. 
is there is there a behavioral phenotype that you can you know through a diagnostic you know interview you could say you know what this sounds a lot like it might have this EEG phenotype as well you know let's refer yeah. out like what is it the interesting I'm thing asking, is, is right? behavior to EEG and EEG to behavior aren't reversible equations earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Okay. The behavior will tell you what neural network is not working properly. Mm -hmm. I have OCD, so my anterior cingulate is not really functioning properly. But it won't tell you what's not working there. It'll tell mm -hmm. you which network isn't working. Mm -hmm. And well, how many OCDs are there in the DSM? One type. We see three separate patterns in the EEG, and they predict medication response. So you know, the EEG ends up giving us a finer gradation of what's wrong there and how to intervene on it than the behavior does. Now, uh, if it was fully reversible, uh, the EEG would be of no added value. You could just do behavioral observation. You'd know exactly what was going on. The intention of the DSM, diagnosis there for therapy, you know, it, it should have worked that way. The problem is that it's not a reversible equation. You know, again, the behavior will tell you what brain region is not working right. It won't tell you how it's not working right. right. It's just, you, you know, you there's that. a problem. You don't know what exactly what kind. Yeah. So uh, in ADD, something frontal where you've got attention and affect and all that stuff up there. Well, it, it could have an epileptiform discharge. It could have theta. It could have alpha. It could have beta. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but the frontal lobe is not working properly. So the symptom that you see emerges from that network not working properly. So um, for years, my lectures in, in Europe, I can't travel anymore, but my lectures in Europe, I would arrive with no prepared lecture at all. And they would hand me six EEGs I'd never seen before and tell me the age of the patient only. And I would then process the data and tell them about the patient. You're like a Kreskin. That, yeah, it, exactly. I hold the data up to my head and I tell them what the patient is. You get a Johnny like. Carson sort of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a little fancier. You know, I've got computerized wiggly line things instead of a, an envelope against a turban on my head. But it, 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 it looks just as magical to the people who come into the workshop who, yeah. if you ask them before they see it happen six times in a row accurately, yeah. can you look at the EG and give me a personality read on the patient. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. It's good for epilepsy and encephalopathies, but no neuropsychological evaluation. That's, that's beyond the beyond the pale. Um, when they see it done six times in a row, it's a parlor trick, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, who reads EGs with no history or never having seen the patient? I do. I prefer seeing nothing mm -hmm. ahead of time. I, if I... It, 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 you tell me, oh, this person has OCD. I'm thinking anterior cingulate. Well, if I'm looking there, I'm not looking here. You know, uh, um, you're going to have a, a bias, a perceptual yeah. bias. And you can't read clean if you've got a perceptual bias. So I prefer knowing the age to give me kind of a general expectation of, you know, the tuning and that sort of thing. But af does after gender, that, does, like, sex me does sex matter? I mean, like, do you want to know? Uh, and, and I, in fact, I have urged people to uh, create their databases um, and, and the Korean database, which is fairly new, uh, followed my advice and kept the male and female data separate. All the other databases previously 
had grouped them together, saying they're generally the same, so we just combined them. Um, you know, I, I can tell males and females uh, apart, but not by their EEG as alone. But the the advice turned out to be accurate because they they see quantitative differences between the males and females, uh, especially through the developmental trajectory uh, early in life and then later in life. At age 45, 50 on up, females get fast activity in their EEG and males go kind of electrically silent by comparison. Mm. So uh, um, you, you can't, you know, if you have a lot of gamma in one group and hardly any gamma in the other group, you want to average that together and then compare yourself to the average of lots and none. I mean, you know, there, there isn't any middle ground there. I mean, you're, you're either in one or the other of the two groups and um, having them separated allowed uh, for the ability to see the differences accurately. Yeah. Yeah. We already know that males and females brains aren't necessarily looking the same structurally. On the average, males have a bigger left hemisphere than right hemisphere. We all get puffed up and happy about that. Oh, we got a bigger brain, you know, but um, females have a gigantic, well-developed corpus callosum connecting the two hemispheres. We got the spindly little thing. We should have colossal envy. You know, it, it, it's, it's astounding how structurally different they are. And at the same time, everybody was saying, well, they're kind of the same, so we combined them. Uh, you know, it, it just rubbed me as, as not really being correct. And I, I suggested that it's going to be twice as hard. So if you follow my advice, instead of taking two years to gather all your data, it'd be four or five years worth of data collection before you have, uh, you know, a thousand people in each group. So, you know, instead of a thousand total, you know, it takes time uh, to do the recording and, you know, sort out who's still in the database or not based on the recordings. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's an expensive uh, venture uh, costing talk- millions of dollars. Well, you're talking about, you're also talking about the, you know, you can see things in aggregate that you can't see individually, right? And so yeah. if you start to mix apples and oranges, then, you know, you're going to get this, this stew that, you know, yeah. is kind of you know hard to hard to make sense of but if you can separate them out you can see these patterns yeah. that become more distinct and as good as fruit salad is sometimes it's nice to know what it is you're chomping on uh-huh. you know so uh-huh. uh, and uh, 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 the ability to actually predict within the cluster you're supposed to be in and compared to ends up giving you a finer uh, uh, resolution right. if you increase the variability in your data set you, you decrease your resolution as to what you say so you know combining males and females really clouded the issue as opposed to clarifying it and i was really happy that my advice worked out because they worked five years of data acquisition you know uh, 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 it, it, you know it was it was not just blind intuition uh, yeah. it was an educated guess but still, it was, still it was still a guess and i'm, I'm glad it worked out because yeah yeah, well, that's yeah. all we that's all we ever do, right? Is guess, right? We just do yeah. these educated guesses, and some of them have greater or more or less risk attached. To yeah. Them. Well, wild guess, you could call it hypothesis if you wanted, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sounds so much more scientific than wild guess, you know. It but, sounds like you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> Jay's got game. Yeah. Do- huh? Doctor J- Jay has serious game. Serious. He does. Game. Yeah, he's great to talk with. So. So, Dr. Brian and Jay, you know, a couple of things that we're dealing with in neurofeedback is number one, mental health, the stigmatism with mental health. And then number two, the technology behind neurofeedback. You know, it, it takes a lot of work to learn. And it also takes work. It's neurofeedback training. So the person that's looking to get improvement, you know, they have uh-huh. to train. We do this, we do this podcast not to make money, even though it'd be nice to make money. Uh <laughs> But to get the word out, <laughs> not allergic to it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, you know, <laughs> Patreon slash NeuroNoodle. <laughs> but but we're, we're using this platform to, like the name NeuroNoodle, to kind of quote unquote dumb it down, make it simpler for parents to understand, to take in the information. Yeah. And, you know, people don't want to watch. A whole hour at once they want you know little little bits and pieces at a time you figured out tiktok how to get your little snippets out there for your audience 
Now, do you have a, a younger audience where you're in, kind of telling them, hey, man, it's not a stigma. It's OK. There's nobody that's perfect. Uh, are they in, starting to do you get them to engage their parents to say, hey, you know, something isn't right here. And then they get a hold of you. How do you use TikTok? I'm not TikTok. Not a lot here. Uh, YouTube is OK. But uh, how does it work for you? Like, because you're a cl you're a clinical provider, and maybe you want to get more clients. Maybe you want to educate people. You've done it. What What do you see with TikTok and using video to to help with the stigmatism and 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 having people get help? So, and, and this is a, uh, uh, I want to just put a dog ear on a question for you, Jay, about accessibility, right? And you know, this is an issue of, of there's, a, there's a number of things, reasons personally why I do it. You know, one is I'm, I'm a bit of a ham and and uh, uh, I'm sure Pete, you don't know that at all, that I'm a bit of a ham. Um, a lot of it. <laughs> but I and and uh, so I enjoy doing that sort of thing. I also enjoy the creative process because it is a challenge. What you're doing is you're boiling down you're trying to boil down ideas that that are can be really complex and they have a lot of different things to them and you're trying to boil it down without losing too much that's essential right and you're gonna you're gonna lose i mean like whenever you simplify something there's gonna be stuff that you lose right um that's why it's simplified um but what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to simplify some of these concepts so that kids can first recognize, oh, wait a minute, I've, se I've seen that. I know that that experience is. I've had that experience. And then connect it to another concept, right? Which is, wait, that, that has a name? Like that experience has a name? And then it's sort of like, yeah. And within that experience, you might've noticed X, Y, and Z was happening with you. So then they can label those. Oh, I felt anxious. Or yeah, I sort of started to shut down after what is shutdown, right? You know, what does that look like? What they can do is they can now, they can start to label their experiences. And the idea, the idea with language and, and any kind of, um, you know, kind of perceptual process, I guess, is you want to put the information into packages that you can use and work with, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put the information into a format that they can use. Now, I don't have a program evaluation, so I don't know how people are using this on on the whole you know on a, on a sort of population level like i don't know how how all well, you know people are using it i do get feedback from people that tell me look you know this is uh one it's it's wow this is so validating you know like to see it enacted and then described is like incredibly validating for me like like I know that my experience isn't like, I'm not crazy. There's a reason why I feel this way. And like, there's things maybe that I can do about it. Um, that's one thing. It also, people have said that they've taken the videos into the therapy room and they've showed them to their therapist like this. This is what, it, this is what it is, right? Because in the therapy room that, you know, that's one of, that's one of the barriers, right? Is the ability to articulate these things, have a vocabulary for these things being able to reflect and, and convey this to somebody else. Like, you know, those are, those are not small limitations that happen in the consulting room where somebody talks to you, you know, where you want to talk to somebody and interview them. And Jay, this is where you're kind of getting at that information, but in a different way. Right. But you want to, what you're relying on is a self-report. Right. And that self-report is like, all oh, it's got all kinds of issues with it. Right. Potentially. Not the least of which is they can't self-report because I don't know. I don't know what it is, right? It's beyond accessibility for whatever reason. But when they see a video, they say, that's what that is. That's what that is. I, and, and they can then take it to their therapist and say, I think this is what this is. The therapist can look at it and say, yeah, I think that is what this is. You know, and then they can kind of move forward from there, right? So that's one function. Um, there, there are definitely problems, uh, that have been cited, I think in, 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 uh, you know, people of journalists have, have identified and rightfully so people that, um, are, 
it's the problem of oversimplifying. It's the problem of wanting to be famous, wanting to be famous. It's there's a voyeuristic piece. But what they end up doing is they say, if you have these three things, then you're this, right? You know, if you have these two things, then you're a sociopath, right? And it's like no, no, you, wrong, right? But the DSA. What what happens, is, well, and it's not, but here's the thing, it's not even the DSM. It's somebody's experience and conception, non-professional. It's their, I mean, they have their own life experience and what they've read that's not curriculum-based. And they are now putting that together and packaging it as, you know, diagnostic information. And what happens problematically is that you have impressionable young people um, that, um, they take, they run with that, you know, they, they, they say, you know, they, I think I'm, I think I have autism or I think I, I think I might be narcissistic or, you know, whatever. And it's based off of, you know, this really, really biased snippet of information. And so that's always the, you know, that's, there's the, the abuse, the misuse of information. It's, it's really easy to do. And it's easy for, it would be easy for me to slip into too. I've actually had in, in the uh, spirit of full self-disclosure, I've actually had people say to me, you know, write in the comments, look, I don't think this is accurate or whatever. And I've thought to myself, you know what? They're right. I got to take it down. You know, this is not a, I don't, I don't like feeling like this video is out there and somebody could potentially look at it and interpret it in this way. Right. And because because it made a lot of sense what the person was saying. Now I also have people come back and say, "This video says this, and this video says that." And I'll say, "That, my friend, is your perception of what happened. <laughs> I do not think that is accurate." And then I can kind of tell by you know other feedback that people get, or people will come on and say, "I don't think you. I think you need to look at the video again, or I think you need to look at this thing on the video, or whatever." Because people will put their own stuff into it um but it is it is a weird little world where you do have to be careful you know uh about how you package that information there's no and it's yeah, and it's yeah. you know it's one of those things that i'm more i think that i think that many psychologists would not do what i do because they're afraid of that, I mean, they're also like they maybe they feel like they can't act or they can't, you know, they they're embarrassed of how they look or all those other things. But they're also really scared. They're really scared that they're going to say something and it's going to be terrible. If, if, you know, it's going to really hurt somebody, and that's that's legitimate. I understand that, but I think that the risks and the benefits. I think that the benefits far outweigh those risks, and particularly. Um, you know, in this age, I think we have to find a way to reach certain populations and we have to we have to go through the methods that they are actually already using. You know, it's sort of it's it's like the old problem of, no, you come to me to my office and you tell me and I will then be from on high. I'll be like, you know, the guy on high who sits and listens and, mm -hmm, and then tells you what it is. Right. It's it's but. What instead I'm doing is I'm going out into the community, right? And it's like I'm giving speeches or I'm, I'm educating people or whatever. And then people are free to take the information and use it, right? They, it's, it's, so it's more accessible. Does that make sense? Yeah. Almost 700,000 people, those little snippets, you're educating somebody. And to your credit, I mean... You're a licensed guy. It's hard to get licensed people on this show to say anything. <laughs> That's why I like dealing with Jay. He'll say whatever. He does it. How do we get past, you know, hey, something's wrong with you. You're not normal. You're, you know, is it, do you see it getting better with kids out there? Also writing a book. Um, and uh, one of the things that I talk about is, you know, how today is unique. Uh, there, there's so many different things that have come together in the last decade or so that make today unique um, in its own way, as far as the concerns that the kids have and, and the stresses and their outlook for the future. And um, there's a couple of things. Number one, there's information over, 
right? There's a lot of information. They are, you know, they, they, it can be good to the extent that I think we have a generation that in some ways is smarter than any other generation we've had. They know things like, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, as civilization advances, the, the younger generations just get way smarter than the previous generations. It's just a natural byproduct. So because of their access to information, and they know things that we had no concept of. providing they are very educated. A number of them are very educated already on psychological concepts. Like, like I never talked about narcissism. I never talked about personality disorders when I was in a sophomore in high school. I didn't talk about ADHD or autism or OCD or I, bipolar. Like we didn't have these terms that we use loosely. A lot of people use loosely, but we didn't have those things. But I think in many ways that's great because it's, it's becoming part of the fabric of our culture, which is that teenagers are learning more and more about what mental health is, what it means, how to manage it, right? They're, they're better equipped, but we have to be careful to still meet them where they're at, not give them too much information, give them information that's accurate, give them information that they can use, right? Um, all of those things. Technology allows us to do that in a way that we couldn't do before. So, but we have to, you know, it's a genie in a bottle. We have to kind of be careful. No, it, it, it does. It makes it easier. I, I would think for the parents, because think about neurofeedback. It, so it gives a voice to people who don't have a voice. They can't yes. articulate what's, yes. what's wrong. So Jay can look without even seeing somebody, you know, what's going, going yes. on. You know what I mean? So, I like yeah. And, and then, you know, talk therapy. Look, you could take a pill, you could do yoga, you could do talk therapy, all of it. You know, it's it, there's not one specific thing to do, right? It's a pill is an immediate quick fix that doesn't last. Okay, neurofeedback takes a long time. But it's, a you know, more of a permanent thing, or or yoga or talk therapy. When I was a parent and I had a kid going through through counseling, it's it just seems like what is the end game to this? You know, well, it's just a routine. I go in for habit. I don't know if anything is, you know, coming out of it. It is nice to see, hey, look, here's here are the issues. Here's a report that shows, you know what, here's physically what's going on, the dysregulation in the brain. And here are the different things that you can do to help help correct it. Talk therapy is one of them and neurofeedback. That's why a lot of clinical psychologists are curious about, you know, neurofeedback. The drug companies, I don't see the incentive on having an end game to mental health because then the money doesn't come anymore, right? I mean, it's just it's just a business thing. But, but let's just say a drug company says, you know what, uh, I'm going to do a neurofeedback machine and have a subscription to it. I, I would think with all these positive results that we're, we are seeing, that's not placebo. The school counselor should have it to help identify, you know, issues, even though people don't like that and you can't do it because of the, you know, uh, the privacy stuff, you know, the jails and it, there's so many things for society that, that it could help. Do you see the budgets increasing for mental health? Because you're dealing with kids. Do you see the, the schools putting more money into it? So part of what part of what you're talking about is scaling too, right? Like being able to scale something. And um, you know, there's there's a couple of things, and I'll 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 get to your try to get to your question. Yeah. But the first thing is one thing that I encounter with with teenagers a lot is their idea of what it means to to make things better. A lot of t a lot of quite times. I get the question, how do I fix it? Which is like a really kind of annoying question. How do I fix this? Right. And it's annoying because it's like one, first of all, you're, you're viewing things. You're not a, you're not an alarm clock. You know, <laughs> you're not a, you're not an Oldsmobile. <laughs> right. There's not, there's not like a, there's not a kind of like a switch or a connection that just sort of gets fixed. Now, in some cases, people report that they have had that experience medicine or whatever, but just really letting people know that this is a process and there are different aspects to the process that have to come together, right? That's a hard thing for a lot of people to, to first of all, to, to think about, but then also to kind of like accept because they, you know, they're in pain. They want change and they want to know, like, 
they want to be empowered. They want to know this is what I can do, right? And you, we can still give those things to people, but we have to let them know too. All right, you got to think about it like this. This is why you're doing that. This is how you're doing that. Also, um, you know, in terms of something like EEG feedback, and this gets probably to my question for you, Jay, which is accessibility. Like in terms of scaling, like right now what we've got is, you know, you know, you've seen how many millions of EEGs. You're like a, you're like a, you're like a treasure in many ways, Jay. You may not think of yourself that way, but you are because you have this ability, you have this wealth of information. Your brain has been trained in a way that you can spot things, right? And you can do like tremendous good for people. How many people like you are there, right? And how many people can you help, right? So you're just sort of like, I mean, I imagine, you know, like sometimes I experience this, but like you just feel anxiety because there's like, I can only do so much. So how the question is then, how do we give what you have away so that other people can do what you're doing? And I don't even know if this is something that can be done, but that a counselor at a school can basically arrive at the conclusions that the Jay Gunkelman would arrive at, right? With much less training, much less experience, right? But they have a machine or they have AI or they have something that's gonna help them do that. We see, we see this with testing programs. I mean, you know, things that can take data and it can put things together to give us a personality profile that's based off of, you know, all kinds of uh, statistical information. So. The question is sort of like, how do we scale what you have to a point where it can happen in thousands of offices, right? I don't have an answer to that, but that seems to be one of the, the one of the primary questions. I mean, what do you think? There are people trying to uh, bottle what I have, basically, in some yeah. way. And uh, um, it, it's, it's a difficult task because... Um, it, uh, they're, they're basically tr trying to use AI uh, to do what I did with my old skin version of intelligence. And um, uh, Emmett Aitken, who's an MD PhD out of Stanford, um, started the project there. And the, they've got an AI algorithm, and they just wanted to feed it lots and lots of data so that it could end up sorting out all of these patterns. The, and, and Stanford had 35,000 EEGs already digitized, ready to go. But those were clinical EGs done for epilepsy and encephalopathies. They weren't done for ADD and autism and depression and bipolar and OCD and personality disorders or, uh, yeah. you know. So they couldn't feed the AI what it needed to end up digesting things yeah. and coming up with the right outcome. Yeah. So uh, they've, they've started to search for more and more data to try to get the data set uh, piece together, uh, and, and it's, it's unfortunate that the and that requires funding, by the way. Yeah, yeah. and they, they need to train the algorithm with all the kinds of things that you can see in order for it to see the things you see. So, um, and it, it, and to possibly change the algorithm if it's not doing. Well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's lots of AI algorithms out there. So, um, uh, but you know, they're uh, they're getting closer. Um, I think one of the things that helps is, is uh, if you publish a model that makes predictions that can be tested. When I came up with a phenotype model, it got rid of the concept of normal versus clinical. You have a phenotype. It, it, it's a proportionality. Uh, a normal person's got to have a phenotype too. You know, it's just, uh, it's not as severely expressed as somebody who's got a clinical symptom. So the leopard doesn't change its spots, it changes its behavior. So the, you, know, you basically end up seeing uh, the, the ability to improve the person clinically, even though you're not gonna change their endophenotype, uh, you can end up improving their function by, by focusing on the operation of their phenotype. So it, we basically have the ability to train or treat. Now training, you end up with a, something you've learned, the skill set that you've got. Uh, treatments, on the other hand, are usually a little bit more of a temporary. No, here, we're, 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 we're wrapping up. Dr. Brian Rosino, hey, man, thanks for taking the time to 
come come on the show. Uh, at Bite Size Therapy on TikTok and Dr. Brian Is that correct? That's the best way for people to learn more about you. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'd love to come back sometime, Jay, and talk with you more. It's fascinating. I, I, uh, I've, I've got a lot of. Uh, I bet that you, I bet you have a lot long line of people that want to pick your brain. But this is, uh, I find this a really valuable opportunity. So I appreciate it. It's always right. fun to interact. <laughs> <laughs> the Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. And a special thanks to our gold and silver supporters. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now.